Hi there, my name is Bruce Clark. I'm the Senior Minister here at St Matthews Manly. And whether you're one of our regulars or it's our, your first time connecting in with us, it's great that you're here for the last of our winter sessions. It's going to be a great day. Now here at St Matt's, we love to sing, and that's exactly what we're going to do to start off our time together today. The words are going to be on the screen, so have a go at singing along if you can, but if that's not your thing, feel free just to enjoy the music. Welcome to church, wherever I may be watching from. Just stand or sit on your couch, just clap your hands and join us as we worship the name of Jesus, as we declare his goodness, mercy and grace upon our lives. We're going to sing, we're going to shout it out. Jesus is alive. Come on, sing. together and worship our Lord for what he has done for us while we sing this we just remember God is good all the time and his mercy in use forever okay we're gonna sing it again every praise is to our God who reigns forever and ever and ever and ever we're gonna go we're gonna go and do it again. One, one, two, one, two, three, go. Every praise is to us.
Let's sing together to our great, great God. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing. Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing, God. Who is told every lightning, but where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? in the sun and give source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing. Struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing, God. Indescribable, uncontainable, You place the stars in the sky and You know them by name. You are amazing, God. Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, You are amazing, God. Oh, indescribable, uncontainable, You place the stars in the sky and You know them by name. You are amazing. Welcome. This winter session this year is titled A Doubter's Guide to Jesus. And for the last two weeks, we've had Dr. John Dixon here with us, who's actually written a book by the same name. And he's helped us examine and explore some of the important titles and roles that were given to Jesus. In our first week, it was Jesus as Christ, the Messiah. Last week, it was Jesus as Judge. And today, as we finish the series, John is going to look at Jesus as the friend. But before we go to that, we're going to hear from Ali as she shares with us a bit about her journey from doubt to faith. My name is Ali and I've been a Christian for about 15 years. My 
my journey from doubt to faith um, has been an evolution and it continues to be an evolution. I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but I had many Christian um, people around me. I had a grandparent, a set of grandparents who um, were Anglican. I went to church sometimes with them when I visited. They didn't talk to me about Jesus. They didn't talk to me about their faith. I just knew they attended church. I had another set of grandparents who were born again Christians and those grandparents paid for my brother and I to go to Christian camp as children um, and they eventually led my mother to Christ when she was in her 40s. I liked what I heard about Jesus but I doubted very much that Jesus was the one and only path to God. I, ha I had a very strong sense of God, of there being a God. I had a very strong sense of um, having a connection and, and, and spirit, but I doubted that Jesus was um, more than a story, maybe. One of my biggest blocks to accepting Christ is that I thought if I accept that Jesus is true and real, I have to accept that there are demons in the world and that the devil is real. And truly, I didn't want to accept that. I didn't want to know that because I wanted it to stay a story. You know, I didn't want there to be evil. Okay, I just didn't want to, to acknowledge that was real. And I had this real fear. If I acknowledge Christ, then I also have to know that actually there is darkness. What I've come to realize is that life with God actually sometimes is actually not, um, it's a bit stranger than fiction sometimes for me I find. I had an experience, I had a, uh, I had an experience where the apartment <laughs> I lived in in Manly um, had a presence living in the apartment or a, a presence in the apartment and I hated it, it scared me. And I actually thought I was gonna to have to move to a, uh, a newer apartment. I didn't realize there was anything I could do about that. And other people who visited often commented about there being something and my husband just said, just ignore it. But it bothered me and um, it's not something I talked to about with my mom, but I went back to Canada to visit and I went to my mom's, uh, now it was a, a, a new church, and I met her pastor for the first time. And he said, oh, hi, nice to meet you, and would you like me to pray for you? And I said, I said, sure. And uh, I, he put his hands on me and he prayed in tongues, which I had never heard before. And then he stopped and he said, there's something in your house. Do you want me to pray for it to leave in Jesus name? And I said, that would be great. And he did. And when I came back, it was gone from Canada to Australia. That's all really creepy, right? But um, that experience was so liberating for me that when I accepted um, Christ, I never had fear again. Once I believed in Jesus, it's like the fear of all of that bad stuff left me. And now I kind of go, wow, how do people, you know, parent and function and without that faith in the protection that I believe I, I have, not for nothing too bad to ever happen, but actually just to never feel um, alone in my life. I was not invited to attend an alpha group, <laughs> but my neighbor was invited. Um, she was handed a, my neighbor was handed a card, um, and this was early in my searching for God when I was on my own journaling and reading the Bible. And I was at my friend's home, 
and her neighbor knocked on her door and handed her a card saying, would you like to come to Alpha? And when she shut the door, she sort of said, you know, awkward, <laughs> you know? And I looked at the details and I thought, I want to go, I want to do that. And so I went. And so I came to Alpha at St. Matt's and um, I came with my anger at the church and I came with my questions about Christianity and my view that it was quite uh, self-righteous to think that, um, that there was only one way to, to God. And you know, it was wonderful because the young people who were involved in my larger alpha group at the time um, they didn't actually try and answer all my questions when I had questions that they couldn't answer this one young woman said to me you know why don't you just ask God you know ask God and about that and I because I had been journaling and had been reading my Bible and um, and was actively seeking God. What I found is that God led me to um, to answers which settled my heart. I really, at the beginning of my faith journey, felt that was what I needed to do: was just seek God with all my heart. And God started to reveal, you know, um, Himself to me as I did that. It's taken me a long time to really know that Jesus is the, the, you know, the real manifestation of God on this earth. And it really, I remember when I discovered, when it sort of hit me, I remember it kind of again, like hitting me like a emotional hit. And I just couldn't get enough of almost telling everyone I knew who had probably thought I was a Christian for a decade. If you know what I, like, I know it's weird, but like, when it really hit me, that's I guess why I say my relationship I think has been evolving and there's some aspects of my own faith that I still don't, that I still feel like a baby. It was only, again, part of my evolution that I realized that relationship with other Christians was so, um, not just beautiful and not just like, I just really do feel like part of Christ body you know and I love that but being part of the women's bible study with women who are in all different journeys and ha and and ha has been the greatest group environment and church community that I could have been in in my um, search for for God really mm -hmm. Thanks, Ali. That was a great story, wasn't it? I've loved getting the chance to hear these stories each week about the various ways that God moves and is at work in people's lives and the different paths each of them has taken in moving from doubt to faith. If you missed them or would like to go back and watch them, we've put all three instalments up on our YouTube channel. One of the things that you would have heard Ali mention was about attending an Alpha course here at St Matthews. It's something we've run many times here over the years and tomorrow night, for the first time, we will be running it online over Zoom. And so for those who are unfamiliar with Alpha, it's a short eight-week introduction to the Christian faith. There's a video that we'll watch, followed by a chance to chat about it and ask whatever questions you might have. Uh, you can speak or you can just listen, but the idea is that by the end, you'll have a better sense of what the Christian life is all about. Here's something to give you a taste. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather gonna be like? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had a 
arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strive to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, we'd be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. If that looks interesting, if you've just got more questions, or if you're just curious to know more, I'd love you to join me. I'll be hosting each session over Zoom starting tomorrow night. There are more details on the websites at matsmanley.org.au and a way for you to register your interest. I'd love to have you along. But for now, it's time for our young ones to head off to Kids Church Online. The rest of us are going to pray and then we'll hear from John. Hi, my name's Aaron and I'm from the Night Church congregation. I'm going to be leading us today in prayer. If you haven't prayed before, prayer is simply talking to God. So feel free to do that with me as I do that now. But if you don't feel comfortable, feel free just to sit there and listen quietly. Let's pray. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Have mercy on us, God, according to your unfailing love and compassion. Blot out our transgressions, wash away all our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us pure hearts, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Help us to wait on you, Lord. Help us to be still and know that you are God. We pray for our nation. Lord, we pray for Australia, in particular Victoria, with increased coronavirus cases. Lord, we pray for peace for comfort and healing. God, we pray in particular as well for the churches in Victoria. God, help them to stand strong, even in this crazy time. I just pray, Lord, that in Victoria, the gospel would go out with great power and with great force in this really troubling time. Lord, we pray for our St. Matthew's community. We pray particularly for our worship ministry here at St. Matthew's. We pray for all who serve by playing, working the sound and data desks, that their efforts might resound to the glory of God and that they might experience the blessing of serving you and us. We bring before you David, our music minister, that you might assist him as he seeks to lead us in magnifying you in word and song. We also continue to pray for his visa application, that the officials dealing with his case would have mercy and that the application would be successful. Lord, please hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all those who are in distress through sickness, grief, and any other infirmity. We pray for those we know who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, and those who are recovering from surgery. 
In particular, we pray for them, Lord, for you to give them peace and comfort. We will now take a minute to pray silently for those people on our hearts. Comfort and heal, merciful Father, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Give us all peace beyond our fears and hope beyond our griefs. You who know our fears and sadness, grant us peace and comfort and joy. Hear us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, my name's Fiona and I'm part of the 6.30 service. Um, Today's Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And I'll let you find that in your Bibles. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Hi again, it's great to be back uh, talking about my favourite subject, uh, the life of Jesus. And we've been sort of looking at aspects of his ministry that um, a lot of people doubt, uh, or at least raise the odd question over. Um, Back earlier in the year, we looked at his portrait as a teacher and you know the question is was he really that unique uh, we also earlier in the year looked at his ministry as a healer and a lot of people think you know in our scientific day how can we take any of that seriously and then just very recently a couple of weeks ago we looked at his title the Christ this is not his surname it is a reference to his authority and of course the the question is you know should we really ascribe to him that level of power and authority And then last week, um, we confronted one of the most difficult aspects of the portrait of Jesus, uh, his role as the judge. He was a preacher of judgment. And of course, it raises all sorts of questions about the justice of God uh, and what what it means for each one of us to be under God's judgment. Uh, Today, we're looking at um, a dimension of Christ's life that could feel a bit like a contradiction to this one. Uh, at least in tension with it. Uh, Jesus as the friend. He's described in the Gospels as the friend of sinners. Uh, One passage we'll look at later uh, from Matthew uh, simply says, here is a glutton and a drunkard, this is a criticism of other people, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's a confronting thought that we'll reflect on in a moment. But you know, um, I can't stand on this spot right here in St. Matthew's Manly uh, without thinking of a funeral I led about three years ago now, standing right in this spot for this woman, uh, Glenda Weldon. The woman I've mentioned many times when I've spoken at this church, who introduced me uh, to the Christian faith. And she embodied one of the most important aspects of Jesus' life that I want to reflect on today. I mean, my own introduction to the faith didn't come through church attendance or Sunday school or Christian parents. I had none of that. 
Uh, but it came through this woman, my high school scripture teacher, who had this amazing way of uh, sort of opening her home to the class that she taught, which I know would now be illegal and ill-advised, but she did, and um, a whole bunch of us went over to her home and ate her hamburgers, milkshakes and scones and listened to her talk about the Christian faith. This was my entry into the faith. And the interesting thing as I reflect back is she was so generous socially with us, um, even though in her lounge room were some of the worst sinners in the school. Um, a school bully was there, a drug addict, uh, one guy with a string of break and enters to his name. Uh, I remember once uh, one of our group on Friday afternoon actually stole her DVD player so he could hock it for some drug money. Actually, come to think of it, I think it might have been a video cassette recorder uh, pre-DVD. But anyway, uh, she put up with us with such a generosity of spirit and her uh, kindness, um, her meals uh, for us, sinners, uh, was the doorway for me uh, to come to the faith. And in fact, about five of my mates, uh, three of whom pictured here, are uh, now actually ministers in uh, churches around the world. Jesus, like this woman, was the friend of sinners and it had a massive impact on people's lives. So let me uh, first say something about the status of sinners, because I know the word sinner is almost comical in our day, but sinners in Jesus' day uh, were not all sort of rapists and murderers and criminals. They could just be people who were unjust, uh, the wealthy who neglected the poor. Maybe they didn't go to synagogue. Uh, they would be sinners. They're, they're just people who are living at a distance from the ways of God. And the important thing to understand in order to really get what this aspect of Jesus' life is all about is that contact with sinners was seriously regulated. Um, it was very difficult to have any contact with sinners without it being seen as some kind of religious crime. Uh, merely being in the presence of a sinner, let alone having a meal, uh, would mean that um, their sinfulness would somehow rub off on you. Here's a text, uh, a Jewish text, uh, not from the Bible, uh, that gives us an, an idea of this contagion of contact with sinners. Uh, it's from what's called the Mishnah. Concerning tax collectors who enter your house, the house is unclean. Concerning thieves who enter the house, only the place trodden by the feet of the thieves is unclean. If there is a Gentile with them, everything is unclean. Gentile is a non-Jew. Um, meals were especially problematic uh, in terms of contact with sinners. Here's Craig Blomberg, who's written a major academic work on this, but he, he puts it in perspective, I think, really well. Ancient Judaism viewed meal times as important occasions for drawing boundaries. Dining created an intimate setting in which one nurtured friendship with the right kind of people. Unclean people and objects constantly threatened to corrupt God's holy elect nation and individuals within it. Like literal physical disease, we may think of ritual impurity as contagious. Sin, in other words, was considered a powerful contagion and meals with sinners uh, was a carrier of that contagion, uh, which brings us to this theme of Jesus as the friend of sinners. He regularly wined and dined with those classed as sinners, with those who should be first in line for judgment. There are many texts on this, but here are just a couple. Uh, Mark chapter 2. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, or this passage that I've already hinted at, um, Jesus said, 
John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It is an astonishing thing that the historical Jesus was sort of written off by religious conservatives as the friend of sinners. That may sound all sort of cool and open to us now, but in the day it was a, a stinging insult. And yet, uh, it was central to Jesus' mission, and our text today uh, makes that perfectly clear. Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And one of the things to know is that um, Jericho was a, a sort of wealthy resort town in Jesus' day. And Zacchaeus, as a chief tax collector, was one of the wealthiest people in the district. Um, despite being short, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, he, he wasn't some sort of marginalized poor sinner in the corner. Uh, he, he was more like a kind of greedy controller in the town. And I reckon we too might have muttered that Jesus would think to spend time with him. And when I reflect on this story, I'm just reminded that God doesn't just love the dejected sinners. He even loves the extravagant, arrogant sinners. And Jesus embodied God's love toward them. He wanted to befriend the sinner, even at the risk to his own reputation. And he did it all because he wanted to save them. And so let me thirdly talk about the salvation of sinners. The really um, key thing about this passage is the response of Zacchaeus to Christ's grace and welcome. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Notice the order of the whole narrative. Um, Christ makes the first move. We've already seen that in the first paragraph, that um, Christ spots him. Christ says, I'm coming to your home. Christ is the one who lavishes welcome on someone he knows is a chief sinner. And, and then Zacchaeus, overwhelmed by that sense of welcome from Jesus, responds with what we call repentance. But it's really just a change of heart that expresses itself in action. In other words, Christ shows his grace to Zacchaeus, and then Zacchaeus responds with this sort of lavish gift back to the poor, uh, and uh, those that he's cheated, he wants to make it up uh, in a really significant way. I mean, the point I'm just trying to make is it's not human action first, and then, you know, Jesus makes a move toward you. Jesus makes his gracious move first, and that triggers a beautiful response. This is all put... Um, well, by one of the great uh, scholars of the 20th century, uh, Ben Meyer uh, from McMaster University in Canada, wrote this. The new thing in the act of Jesus was that he reversed the normal religious structure. He sought communion first, conversion second. His table fellowship with sinners implied no acceptance of their sins, but in a world in which sinners stood inescapably condemned. Jesus' openness to them was irresistible. Contact triggered repentance. Conversion flowered from communion. Nothing could have dramatized the free grace and the present realization of God's saving act more effectively than this 
unheard of initiative towards sinners. Bringing God's salvation into the present was exactly what our passage says Jesus was trying to do. He announces today salvation has come to this house and that he, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. Now, being saved is um, cliched language now, I think it's fair to say. Um, it doesn't just mean becomes a Christian, you know. Uh, it, it really means rescued. Rescued from the judgment of God that we reflected on last week. It's really important to understand that Jesus wasn't just this cool, left-wing liberal who went around saying to everyone, hey, you know, you're loved, <laughs> live it up. No, this is very serious stuff. And we saw last week, Jesus preached judgment like any fire and brimstone preacher, but he did it without a smile on his face. He did it with tears in his eyes. And actually, the thing that underlines the seriousness of this idea of being saved, more than anything else in the whole story of Christ, is that Jesus said he had to die for sinners. He came to bear into himself the justice, the judgment that human beings deserve. That's how he came to seek and to save the lost, because he died for us. That's how he establishes friendship between undeserving people like me, like you, dare I say, and the holy God, the just God. You know, when I um, first came to Christianity, I had no trouble accepting the news that God loved me. And I think the reason for that was that I had a kind of sample of one of a Christian, and it was the woman I mentioned earlier. And she was just so incredibly gracious toward um, all of us, actually. I remember one evening in year 10, um, at the end of a really drunken party, one of my mates um, said, please don't take me home. My, my dad will be you know, really angry if he sees me like this. And the, he wasn't coming back to my place. So uh, we were thinking, what do we do with him? It's nearly midnight. And one of us had this idea. Doesn't the scripture teacher live down the road? And she did. She just lived like 500 meters from the party we were at. So I'm embarrassed to say it now, but we thought it was plausible to go and knock on her door at midnight and ask, can this drunk buddy, you know, bunker here? And we knock on her door. We interrupt a really posh dinner party that she was in the middle of. And yet she didn't bat an eyelid. I mean, she was a teetotaler. She was always on at us about drinking alcohol. But she just said, of course, come in. We um, you know, threw our mate into the shower. She went and got him some spare clothes. Uh, we, we put him in some spare clothes, threw him in one of the uh, guest rooms and left him for the night. And uh, Glenda went back to her posh party with her husband and the guests and so on. And the next morning we turn up at, uh, at her house to collect our mate. And there he is at the kitchen table, Glenda making bacon and eggs for him, chatting away. And there was just this incredible grace toward us even though we knew at the same time that she felt that our lives didn't match up to God's standards. I guess the reason I'm telling you that is that when you have someone like that in your life, it's kind of easy to believe that God loves you despite your sins. You know, my uh, last book uh, is dedicated to this woman. Let me read what's there. Glenda Natasha Weldon, who put up with this godless 16-year-old and his scoundrel mates every Friday afternoon after school, as we ate her hamburgers and scones, debated her God and lost, listened to her read and explain the four Gospels, took advantage of her generosity, caused her frequent headaches, before eventually finding ourselves captivated by the story she told about the man from Nazareth. 
even if you don't have someone like that in your life, um, we do have Christ who displayed through his meals the friendship God wants with the undeserving. And more than that, we know that his death and resurrection was for us, bearing our punishment so that we could be clean, so that we could experience the love of God, so that we could be friends with the Almighty. It's an extraordinary thought. I suppose Christians can get really used to it, but I hope that those that maybe are just on the edge, just thinking about all this, will see the beauty, the uniqueness, the extraordinary nature of the central Christian claim that Christ is the friend of the sinner.
Let me close our time together by asking a very important personal question. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the teacher? Is he the healer? Is he the saviour, the Christ, the judge, but also the friend? I personally think that there's actually nothing more important in all of the world than our response to the claims about Jesus. Because if these claims have any truth to them, that he did actually live, that he was actually God, and that he willingly gave up his life to save sinners like you and myself, then what we do in light of these claims actually matters. What we do next, how we respond, that actually matters. And I'd like to think that none of us, whether you've been attending church your whole life or if today might be your first encounter with the Jesus of the Gospels, that every one of us has considered their response. And as we've heard today, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And I know there'll be people here today that as you're listening, you just sense you are lost. Maybe you've been feeling lost for a long time. What am I here for? Where is my place? Where is all this heading? Where am I supposed to be? Well, the answer is loud and clear, right beside the Saviour. Jesus came to die for sinners, to seek and save the lost, to establish friendship with the likes of us. And if Jesus really did exist, if he really was who he claimed to be, and if he really did rise from the dead, then actually you can really be forgiven. And it doesn't matter what you've done. You really can be welcomed into his family, no matter how lost you may feel. And you really can have hope in the new life he offers, no matter how hopeless life might feel right now. And if that's something you want, if that's something you've come to realise you need, you can do something about it right now. The Bible in Romans 10, 13 says these words, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you'd like to receive this salvation into your life today, I want to invite you to call on the name of the Lord right now by doing three simple things, admitting, believing, and committing. We're admitting that we're lost, that we've turned our back on God. We're believing that Christ died for us in our sins and we commit our life to Him. And so if that's you, let's bow our heads and pray right now. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and then you pray along with me. Heavenly Father, I admit today that I'm lost, that I'm far from You, that I've turned my back away from You. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me and my sin to forgive me. Thank you. And I commit my life this day to following Jesus as my master and my friend. In his name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer along with me, I'd love you to get in contact with us by going to our website or filling in a connection form that's on the side in the chat room. But also think about signing up for the online Alpha course that I mentioned earlier in the service that starts tomorrow night. We'd love to hear your story. We'd love to be in touch to help you journey now with Jesus as your friend and your master. Well, we're going to be back next week, same time, same place, starting a new series. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a blessed week.